Welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church in Holland, Michigan. My name is Paul Van Kempen. I'm the associate pastor here. And we're glad that you've joined us for worship today. A couple quick announcements for the life of the church. Next Sunday, April 24th, is our area's crop walk. Uh, we have a church team that is walking in the crop walk. We also have a youth team walking in the crop walk. And I'd encourage you to follow the links in the description to this video to donate to those teams. All of the money raised by the crop walk goes to end food insecurity in the area. So it's for a really good cause. The Sunday after that, May 2nd, is our first Sunday worshiping outside together. We'll be meeting on the south side of the building in the parking lot. I encourage you to bring your own chair and to bring a mask and to come ready to worship God together outside in God's good creation. Finally, an update on a member of the congregation, Joanne Karn had a fall last Sunday. She broke her leg and ended up having a hip replacement, and she is now recovering in rehab at Skilled in Zealand. There's no visitors allowed there now because of COVID, but I'm sure she would appreciate your cards. With that, let us continue in worship together with the lighting of the Christ candle. Jesus, you appeared to the disciples in a closed room, showing them that you had risen from the dead. May you be present with us today as we worship you from our own homes. This light from this small candle fills the room and reminds us that your light and your love are here with us today. Jesus Christ, light of the world, fill us with your light and with your love so that we may worship you with gladness. Amen. Jesus Christ. 
Please join with me in the unison prayer written by Tom Schumann. Let us pray. We are witnesses to the love God has poured into us. We are witnesses of God's love, sharing it with each person we meet. We are witnesses to everyone we encounter, little children like us, sisters and brothers in God's family. Hi kids, welcome to worship. We're glad you've joined us today. We have a new song for you today. This song is called Seed, and this song is about planting a seed in the ground, giving it the things it needs to grow, and then watching what comes up out of the ground. A seed is like an idea or a dream or a hope that you have. And when you plant that in a place like this church and nurture it and give it love and help it to grow, that dream or hope can become a reality in the world. And that's what we want for you at this church, for you kids at this church. That when you have a dream or an idea or a hope, that you feel like this is a safe place to plant that idea and to let it grow. So if you have a dream or an idea or a hope, bring it with you to this church. And together we'll watch that grow into something beautiful in this place. Let's sing together. Take the seed that you have and plant it here. Give it water and time for a day or a year. Take the seed that you have and plant it here. Give it love. Give it
Good morning, kids. It's good to be with you again. Today I'm going to read a verse from the Bible for you before I talk about it. It's found, as you can see, almost to the end of the Bible. It says, Look at us. We are called children of God. That's who we really are. Well, last week, I wore this preaching stole. And maybe you remember it if you saw the video from last week. When I prayed, I wore it because it makes me feel close to children. If you can see it, it has children of the world all over it. When I was your age, I learned a song called Jesus Loves the Little Children. And part of that says, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. And I felt so good when I sang that song. I just knew that I was loved. And there are so many things for you to learn about in this big world that God has given us. But you don't have to know everything. Even your parents and your aunts and your uncles and your grandparents and even your teachers don't know everything. So my daughter teaches kindergarten and first grade. And her classroom motto is, is it safe? Is it kind? Is it your best work? These questions help her students remember how to show love in their classroom. Do you remember the story Miss Sandy read to you last week? If you missed it, you can pause right now and go back to that service and listen to her reading the story. But it was about animals who thought they were the biggest or the smartest or the fastest or the cutest. And then there were children who thought they were the most important. It was a very big problem. So who does God love best? Do you remember? There was a line at the end of that story God's love is big enough for everyone because God loves what God has created. All of creation is God's best work. We show God that we love God and this world by being safe, being kind, and doing what is best. Pray with me. Thank you, God, for giving us your son, Jesus, to show us how to live as your children in this world. Help us every day to be kind and loving for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke in the 24th chapter, starting with verse 36. Listen for God's word. While they were saying these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were terrified and afraid. They thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you startled? Why are doubts arising in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. It's really me. Touch me and see, for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. As he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Because they were wondering and questioning in the midst of their happiness, he said to them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. Taking it, he ate it in front of them. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law from Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And a change of heart and life for the forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God in heaven, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
as I'm sure you know, we live in an era of fake news. You can't believe everything you read on the internet. This is especially true for celebrity death announcements. There has been a trend in the last 10 years or so of online trolls and hackers and pranksters breaking into Twitter accounts of celebrities and announcing their death while they are still alive and kicking. This has happened so often that many people, when reading, for example, that Eddie Murphy died in a snowboarding accident, or that Woody Harrelson died in a plane crash, or that Adam Sandler also died in a snowboarding accident. These are all real fake announcements, by the way. When they read these things, instead of immediately offering words of condolence or expressing their sadness, they first ask if this is a real announcement or not. These celebrity death hoaxes put the celebrity in the interesting position of having to prove that they are indeed still alive. I've never been in that situation. You probably haven't either. But usually the celebrity or the celebrity's publicist puts out a statement on social media or an oppressed statement affirming that the celebrity is not in fact dead and confirming, confirming that they are alive and well. There's often a bit of levity in these statements. It's kind of an absurd situation. But this is where the era of social media has led us. Today in our scripture reading, we find Jesus in a similar position. He has appeared to the disciples and has to prove to them that he is in fact alive and not a ghost. The difference is that his death wasn't a social media hoax, but he was actually dead. The disciples saw Jesus on the cross. They saw him die. The women saw his body put into the tomb. All the evidence they had pointed to Jesus really being dead. When they see him in the room amongst them, amongst them they are terrified, afraid. They are startled. They thought they were seeing a ghost. And so Jesus has the strange and unique task of proving to disciples that he is not dead. How would you go about proving to the disciples that you aren't dead? It's an interesting question. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, Aslan the Lion, a clear allegory for Jesus, dies and is resurrected. When the resurrected Aslan appears to Lucy and Susan, they first think that he is a ghost. But to prove that he is not a specter, Aslan breathes a warm breath on Susan to show that he is alive and breathing. Susan and Lucy then get on Aslan's back and ride through Narnia. It's a joyful scene, a scene that shows that Aslan is strong and vital and a majestic lion. In this work of fiction, this is how C.S. Lewis chooses to prove that Aslan is alive. But in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus takes a different approach to prove to the disciples that he is not dead. And I think the contrast with Aslan is helpful. Jesus does two things to show the disciples that he is not dead, to prove that his body is not a ghostly representation, but that he is in fact bodily resurrected. And in these two ways, he not only offers evidence of his resurrection, but he also teaches the disciples and us what it means to be witnesses to these things, as he tells the disciples at the end of our passage today. We're going to look at each of these two actions Jesus takes to prove he is alive in turn. The first thing Jesus does is to show the disciples his hands and his feet Listen again to the scripture reading from verse 38. Jesus said to them, Why are you startled? Why are doubts arising in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. It's really me. Touch me and see, for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. As he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. This seems like a peculiar thing to do. Would you recognize your friend's hands and feet? 
You'd recognize their face for sure. Maybe you'd even recognize their walk or their body. But what about their hands and feet? But the disciples recognize Jesus' hands and feet because they bear the marks of his gruesome death on the cross. Jesus, to show them, to prove that he is alive, shows them the scars, the marks of his vulnerability and defeat that brought him to death on a cross. He even asks them to touch his hands and his feet. I wonder, were his wounds still painful? Were they still open wounds? Did their touch bring a wince of pain to his face? This is a remarkable way to show the disciples that he is alive. Jesus proves his life by showing them the signs of his death. He doesn't breathe on them. He doesn't say, look at my face. He doesn't recount personal details about each of the disciples that only he could have known. Instead, Jesus leads with his scars, with his vulnerability. This is God's son, raised from the dead, still marked and maimed by the signs of his death. He is not a perfect, majestic, roaring lion like Aslan. Instead, Jesus shows the disciples that he is humble and vulnerable, even here after his resurrection. What would it look like for us to be like Jesus in our witness What would it look like for us to lead with our scars? What if we as Christians, instead of hiding our scars and vulnerabilities, allowed them to be part of our witness to the risen Christ? We all feel the pressure to hide our faults, our uncertainties, our pains, our vulnerabilities. We hide anything that gives the world a glimpse that we are not perfect. But when we do this, when we hide our scars, I think we hide our true selves. This has become ever more true in the era of social media. On Facebook and Instagram and other sites, we carefully curate our posts and our pictures and our words to craft the life that we want others to see, not the life that we really live. We post the pictures where we look the best, We post uh, things about our kids where they're behaving and smiling and acting like the perfect angels we want them to look like. We don't talk about the hard parts of our days or the ways we have failed as parents or siblings or even as followers of Jesus. But we all have pains and baggage and a history. And I think by letting the world see those vulnerabilities— we can also let the world see how in our stories, Jesus overcomes all the pain and brokenness with his resurrection promise. Our scars, like Jesus's scars, are part of our witness to the world. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor and theologian and an anti-Nazi dissident, once wrote from his Nazi prison cell, a cell where he was being held for his role in a plot to assassinate Hitler. It was just a little writing, a little scrap of paper that uh, got out of the cell. But he had written on that scrap of paper that only a suffering God can help. Only a suffering God can help. Bonhoeffer knew that the suffering Savior in Jesus, the Savior with scars and wounds and vulnerability, That this was the kind of God that can help us when we feel abandoned, when we feel weak and vulnerable. Jesus suffered, and his resurrection didn't remove the scars caused by that suffering. And in those scars, we see our own pain. We also see the promise that one day that suffering will be gone. This is our story. This is our witness the risen Christ. The second thing Jesus does after showing the disciples his scarred hands and feet is to express his hunger. 
Listen again from verse 41. Because they were wondering and questioning in the midst of their happiness, Jesus said to them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. Taking it, he ate it in front of them. Jesus asking for something to eat, like showing them his scars, reveals his vulnerability. He is risen from the dead, but his body still needs sustenance. He still needs the calories for energy for his physical body. The difference here, the difference between the scars and the hunger, is that the disciples can meet this need. They couldn't do anything about his scars. They were permanent and unfixable. But his hunger, his hunger, this they could fix. So they bring him a piece of baked fish to eat. And as he eats, the disciples draw closer to him. They're no longer startled or afraid, but they are again listening to their teacher and savior explain what has happened. By asking for a bite to eat, Jesus asks for hospitality, and he allows the disciples to care for him. This too is a reminder and a lesson for what it means to be witnesses to the risen Jesus. Just as the disciples fed Jesus when he was hungry, we too can feed others when they are hungry. This is part of our witness in the world. I'm reminded of Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats. It's a familiar passage, you might remember it. And in this parable, uh, Jesus, Jesus, in a vision of the returned Jesus, says that the righteous will be those that fed, clothed, welcomed, and visited him. The righteous reply, and I'm going to read right from Matthew 25 here. They say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and give you clothes to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. The disciples feed Jesus a fish. And we too can feed Jesus by caring for those around us. One of these least of the brothers and sisters of mine, Jesus says. By feeding the world around us, we are caring for Jesus. And we are witnessing to the resurrected Jesus. We also, like Jesus, can be the recipients of this hospitality. When we are hungry or spent and tired, we too can receive hospitality from others. This is part of being a witness to Jesus too. So these are the two things Jesus does to show the disciples that he is not dead, but that he is indeed risen. He shows them his scars and he expresses his hunger. And in these two simple acts, Jesus gave the disciples and us a powerful example of what kind of witnesses he wants us to be in the world. Jesus shows us that we should lead with our scars. And in doing so, we reveal that we are real people with real problems who find hope in the story of Jesus because only a suffering God can help. And in meeting the hunger of others, and revealing our own hunger, we can be participants in divine hospitality, caring for our sisters and brothers so they know the love and grace of God. We're not celebrating communion today. We'll be doing that in a few weeks. But this communion table next to me here is a perfect reminder of what it means to be witnesses to Jesus. The elements, the bread and the cup, are reminders of Jesus' body broken and blood poured out. They're reminders of his scars. They're reminders that we serve a suffering God. But this table is also a place where we gather and where all are fed, both spiritually and physically. This table, like Jesus' post-resurrection appearance, is a reminder that when we witness to Jesus... We lead with our scars and we feed the hungry.
And in doing so, we bear witness to God at work among us. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have created the heavens and the earth and populated it with a great variety in both plant and animal worlds. You command and even the wind obeys you. We give you thanks that we can rely on your strength as well as your wisdom. Your ways are so much higher than ours, yet you show us love and mercy through Jesus Christ. We need to be cherished by you, and you do not disappoint. We give thanks for those recovering from illness or surgery. Joanne Karn, Jan Peterson, Glenda Simpkins, Sherry Harris. And we continue prayers for Eric Heller, Dick Gebbin, and Stephanie Edwards. We lift up those who are suffering in hidden ways from chronic pain, from broken relationships, from emotional stress, from addictions. As the pandemic continues, we plead for our citizens to put others before themselves and to consider how to be safe and kind in their actions. We give thanks for the many ways you call us to serve this community. We are grateful for those who are leaders in local and state government. May they turn to you for guidance in making their decisions. We pray for government of this nation as well as for the places of unrest and disturbance in this country. Only in your grace can we find true peace across the entire globe. Come quickly to save us. And looking beyond the walls of this building, we see how vast is your love for your children. We celebrate our rebirth in baptism and gratefully say the words your son taught all disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When we say we support the ministry of this church, we are, in effect, saying we give to a worldwide ministry through our offerings. We partner with local and global organizations to provide funds, prayers, and work on the ground. Thank you for joining with us in supporting God's work here at First Presbyterian Church. Let us pray. Eternal God, Help us discern how, when, and where to use the gifts you have given us. May we serve you by being Christ-like in serving those we meet. Appear to us once again as our risen Savior. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
Jesus calls us as his disciples to be witnesses in the world, witnesses who are open and honest and vulnerable, and witnesses who serve and feed the hungry in the world. May we go out from this worship today ready to love and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.